So what I was going to talk about this evening is about innovation, but how it links to culture, leadership, and I've thrown in this at the end to sort of ginger it up a bit about regime change. I'll come to that at the end. Um, so that's the outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to go through that, but we're going to talk about leadership, culture, how it relates to performance, and maybe some practical things that you can take away with you. I really like this quote. I always believe that it's really, really important to go with the grain of nature because, you know, nature's been around for an awful lot longer than we have and it's kind of got it sorted. And I see innovation as mutation. You know, in order to innovate, you have to continually mutate. Some of those mutations in your organisation are bad. You need to identify them, kill them quickly. But some of those mutations are good. And actually, those are the things that enable you to innovate. So if the organisation you have tomorrow is the same organisation you have today, sooner or later you'll be dead. You need to continuously evolve and mutate. So this, is, this quote from Darwin is not about might is right or anything like that. It's about continually, uh, continual adaptation. This is fact. Innovative companies are led by innovative leaders. But actually, that's necessary but insufficient. Um, so you might be an innovative leader, but unless you get the leadership skills right, that's not necessarily going to be able to cascade out throughout the organisation. So just hold the, the, those two quotes in your mind for the time being. So let's go back to leadership. What is the role of the leader? So because I've only got 20 minutes, I would like to sort of bring up a debate on this, but let's just distill it back to its elemental parts. And of course the first one is, if you haven't got any followers, you're not a leader. Make sense? Mm -hmm. The next one is, actually, the leader would bring them to a place they wouldn't ordinarily go. That word bring there is really important. It's not pointing and saying, you've got to go there. It's actually about moving to the people, putting, metaphorically speaking, your arm around them, and saying, come on, just go this way. And third, which is something that people really forget, is that actually leaders usually inspire new leaders. So if the leaders in the room are here, I suspect that if you go back through your life, there will be somebody in your life who inspired you in some way. Yeah? I mean, of all the work that we have done, it's usually the case that people that become leaders mm -hmm. have at some point been inspired by somebody in their lives. It could be a parent, it could be a teacher, it could be one of your first employers. It could be somewhere when you're being fairly low down in an organisation. Just somebody. It doesn't need to be the Mandelas or the Churchills or whatever. Somebody meaningful to you. So how does that work? Okay. So in order to gain followers, we use this sort of metaphor of emotional intelligence, about empathy, about connecting on an emotional level, so that you relate to people and people relate to you. And that's why they follow you. For those of you who have done the qualifications and what have you, Actually, the bring them to the place is what you get in your MBA, okay? Strategy, finance, segmentation, all of those sorts of things. It's about the IQ of identifying where the markets are going to go, for, uh, go to. There may be um, an intuitive element in that, but largely, that's what that's all about. So, the key thing here is around the soft elements. Because again, you can be innovative, you can have all the MPAs and the qualifications, but that does not necessarily make you a good leader. So just to look at that element of, because it's a huge topic, emotional intelligence. Um, and just to make sense of emotions, um, and actually emotion, there's one emotion, which is the stifler, the suppressant, of all innovation. Anybody has it a guess as to what that might be? Fear. Fear. Oh, brilliant. You've been primed. Absolutely. So it's about, actually, you can't stop emotions happening, but what you can do is to manage those emotions. 
And the first step about doing that is to be self-aware. Self-aware about what emotions you are feeling at a certain point and how you're going to manage that. So that's why we start with self-awareness, self-management, and then through extrapolation, it's about social awareness, that empathy thing about moving beyond you, and how you manage those relationships. Right? Now, we could run a whole day, in fact, we could run a whole program on emotional intelligence. If you're really interested in learning more about emotional intelligence, I would recommend that you read Daniel Goldman's book, New Leaders. Right, and if anybody wants that reference, give me your email address at the end and I can email it to you. But in that context, there are six leadership styles. So visionary, coaching, affiliative, democratic, pace setting, and commanding. These are a collection of behaviours. The ones that we find most common in an organisation are commanding and pace setting. So commanding is telling people what to do, okay? which is really useful when you're in a sinking ship and you want to know that somebody's in control. So go and put your life jacket on, go to the boat deck, get in a boat, lifeboat, fine, good, somebody's in control, that makes me feel really good. But if you've got a highly intelligent company, or if you've got any sort of company, and you keep telling people what to do, then sooner or later they realize, actually, you're taking responsibility for all the decisions here. So I don't have to take any responsibility for any of the decisions. I can stop challenging. I can stop innovating. It's all down to you. Pay setting, if you've got a highly effective team, you can work wonders by putting your foot on the gas. You can move mountains, but if you don't understand empathy and you don't realize what well, sooner or later people are going to stop falling off the back of that peak or trough because they've got family commitments or they just can't stand the strain or the whatever, then people begin to fall off the back. But those are the two most common leadership styles that we find. They are not the most effective for innovation and I'll come back to what they are later. So what style you use very much depends on what you want to achieve. Let's just now look at the relationship between leadership and culture, which is not a direct relationship at all. Actually, the leader in an organization sets the climate. So in a context that we might all understand, when Barack Obama took over from w. George Bush, he would have set a new climate in the White House. He may have even set a new climate you know, in terms of what was going on in the media in the States. But did he change the culture? No, he didn't. And he probably won't have changed the culture in the States until long after his second term is over, if he gets a second term. So climate is something that you can actually set pretty quickly. Climate affects the employees, the people around you, and it's that dynamic between the two which gives rise to culture. And actually, it's the culture of an organization which generates performance. And going back to the Darwin quote at the, uh, at the beginning, it's actually the culture in the organization which allows innovation or stifles it. So as leaders, it's the culture that you generate which has the ultimate effect on whether you're going to be an innovative company or not. So culture might be looked at in this sort of way, moving from this is the way we do things around here. What you actually want is this is the way we do and improve things around here, bringing in that innovative thing. So let's now look at culture in a more you know, deconstructed a bit. And a guy called Harrison came out with a four culture model, which is based around power, four elements, power, structure, achievement, and support. So power is about, you know, power is information, power is everything. 
Okay. Um, structure like the armed forces, well, once you've done this job for so many years, you can move up to the next level, so it doesn't move around very easily. So achievement is just that. You need to be fairly nimble. Um, and support. And, you know, you can take those elements to the extremes, and there will be some beneficial elements to those things, but there can also be some negative ones. So an organisation which is all about power actually you're going to be jockeying for position and jockeying for power. Um, one which is all about support isn't going to be actually terribly business focused. It's all going to be about supporting each other. One which is all about achievement may give rise to things like the banking crisis. Mm. Right? So all of these things need to be done in measure. And research shows that the ideal combination of these four elements is something like this. So some power, <coughs> little power, a little bit more structure, a lot around achievement, and then some support that goes with it. And when we do culture surveys in organisations, this is what we get, time after time after time, is, and our culture survey looks at observed and desired. And what you might get in a large, say, a large organisation such as Unipart is that the observed differs <coughs> throughout the organisation hugely, but the desired always comes out in the same profile, which is that profile. <coughs> so if you're looking to generate an innovative style of organisation, you need to be looking at things in that sort of proportion. You know, some structure, but not too rigid, so that things can be pretty fluid, pretty nimble. Power, let power, you know, go. Don't be an autocrat. Let people have their, their head in what's going on. Have a lot around acknowledging achievement and be supportive so that you create actually a safe environment where people are not going to be chastised or fearful for making a suggestion which doesn't necessarily then go anywhere. So we've got leadership styles, and then we've got culture. So how do those two yeah, work together? <laughs> this is a really complex slide, and I'm not going to expect me to learn it or anything at all. But what we've done is we've put those leadership styles together and the culture together. So we've done the work for you. The key things I want you to look at here is that the green arrows, or the blue arrows, are around where there's positive influence. The red ones are the negative influence. So actually, commanding and pace setter, setter have a negative influence on innovation. The things that have the most, the leadership styles that have the most positive effect on innovation <coughs> are visionary and democratic, okay? So the visionary style, really the most positively strongly strong of all of the leadership styles. And it's really good when you're setting a goal of what you want to achieve, an ambiance, a culture, a climate of what you're looking for, that picture of the future. And of course what that does is give a framework for the people in your organisation almost to think, is the decision I'm going to take right now going to get us closer to or further away from, your, from the vision that the person who's leading this organisation has set for us? I mean, I've, I've not attended all of these sessions, but I've heard the name Steve Jobs come up time and time and time. Again. He just sat people in the lift. He didn't sound like a very nice man. So to be controversial. No, I, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that he was no. a terribly nice man. But what he had, what he did have, was a really strong sense of vision. And of course, the second bit then is about the democratic style, which is again positive. But what it does is gives people a voice, and that voice which can be heard. This is not all about voting all the time and going to a referendum on every decision that you make. But it's about making people visible and giving people a voice. And at the bottom here, um, and the same with the visual star, it's these behaviours. And the behaviours that are listed here are the ones that are on your checklists that you've just looked at.
And this is just an example of how those simple granular behaviors actually then begin to translate through to the uh, through the emotional awareness or through the emotional intelligence through into culture and it's those particular things which give then give rise to uh, business performance and innovation so they create an ambiance in the organization so going back to regime change then and just to bring the sort of the whole thing together and when I first um, gave a presentation like this, it was when the Arab Spring was just getting going. And at the same time, we had Iraq. So we had George W. Bush, who wanted to affect regime change, and he had applied the usual tools, which was to send in lots and lots of troops, invade the country, spend a huge amount of money, huge amount of human lives, um, and has been, you know, they had a plan for day one, but not day two. And actually, it completely kind of went against the grain. And then at the same time, you had Tunisia, where the people actually rose up, and their tool was mobile phones um, and social networking, and sitting in the backs of taxis, because they, they knew if they had certain conversations in the backs of taxis, then it was the taxi drivers that would relay the information to meet in whatever square and form a movement. So it be, was because they didn't have access to the military might of America. So it's often constraint that is actually a really rich seedbed for having to innovate. You know, there are very few, going back to, going back to the um, uh, biological thing, there are very few products or services in this, in this world that don't have to mutate and innovate. Marmite is one I can think of because it's been around for years and you either love it or you hate it. But it's not really changed. They put it in a squeezy bottle. That's about all they've done. Um, salt, sugar, you know, those sorts of things. They're still exactly the same. They may be marketed slightly differently, but nothing much has changed. So if you're going to uh, innovate, then you need to do something radically different. And actually, as a leader in an organization, if you don't continue to innovate, but stifle innovation, and actually, Frank, it's the larger companies who are most fearful of innovation, mm -hmm. even though they try and propagate it. Then the people who want to innovate leave the big companies, they go and set up small companies, and they innovate the hell out of it. So the message here is that actually, if you don't allow a good, and I'm not pointing at Unipar here at all, <laughs> it's a symptom of large companies. It actually, if you don't provide a culture which um, propagates innovation, then the innovative people simply leave or do something about it themselves. And that's what happened in Tunisia. Actually, the innovative people thought, we've got to do something about this, and those were the tools that they used. Right. So that really is my <coughs> regime change at the end. I just wanted to leave, I don't know if you can read this. It says, if only you could attach attach it to a hat. If only you could attach it to a hat. All right. Well, that's my 20 minutes up, so thank you. Well done. Excellent.